Hi, everybody. My name is Brother David, and I'm a Capuchin Franciscan. Now, I don't know if you know what those words mean. Uh, Franciscan means that um, I'm a follower of St. Francis of Assisi, and I belong to a group of men who try and follow Christ by following St. Francis of Assisi. And I'm sure you've all heard of St. Francis of Assisi, especially since Pope Francis took Francis as his name when he uh, entered the papacy. Um, Capuchin is just the name of our particular branch of the Capuchin of the Franciscan family. Uh, we were founded in the early 1500s, and when we were founded, there were a lot of other Franciscan groups kind of running around Italy um, and doing different things. And how the people in Italy told the, the difference between us and other Franciscans is that we have this big, long, pointy hood. You, you know, like that. We have this big, long, pointy hood, you see? And the word for hood in Italian is capuch. And so we were called the hooded ones or the cappuccini. Uh, so we share our names with cappuccino coffee and with capuchin monkeys. Uh, the monkeys were named after us. Now, as to a brother, uh, how do I explain a brother? I, all of you have family. I know some of you have brothers and sisters. And when you think about your relationship with your father, right, your relationship with your father is kind of like this. Your dad's kind of up here and you're kind of down here, right? And then those of you who are brothers and sisters, you know that your relationship with your brother or your sister is a little more like this, right? Ideally, this is what your relationship with your brothers and your sisters are, right? Your relationship with equals. And that's my relationship in the church. Um, I don't have the added respect that a priest gets, um, but I make the same promises, the same vows. I live the same life. I do the same things that they do. I just don't do sacramental work. I don't say mass. I don't, um, I don't hear confessions. I don't do things like that. But other than that, I live the same life, I pray through the same prayers, I make the same promises, the same vows, and that's who I am. Uh, I like this relationship a lot better, which is why I decided not to become ordained, why I decided to be a brother. But my story, or why I enter religious life, goes back oh, a long way, right? It always does. Um, <clears throat> so I grew up in a very religious family. I'm the oldest of eight kids. I have uh, five, four brothers and three sisters, and I'm the oldest. And when I was growing up, my mother was always like, you should be a priest. You, you should enter religious life. You should do those things. And I always kind of smiled and nodded and wasn't going to do that, right? Um, I wanted to be an artist. I was sure I was going to be an artist because my dad had been art. And it was very much uh, an inspiration for me. I wanted to be an artist. And then uh, when I was in high school, <clears throat> again, my mom was, you should consider being a priest. You should consider being a religious life. Whatever everything she was saying, I finally lost my cool one day. I said, Mom, leave me alone. Stop bothering me. I am not going to be a priest. I'm going to be an artist. And God bless her. She left me alone. She didn't say another word about it. Um, and she left me to do my own thing. Interesting enough, very shortly after that, I decided I wasn't a good enough artist to do it professionally. So I stopped doing art. So I ended up going to college. And I studied uh, theater and English. I started writing poetry, and I really loved writing poetry. And I just rediscovered my art as a scenic designer designing sets for plays. I really loved the theater. Um, and then I went to graduate school. I went to Detroit. Um, I went from a very small town in Indiana to Detroit, right? And Detroit is, uh, if you know about Detroit, it's a huge, it's a big city, mostly urban sprawl, a lot of poverty. Um, and I've never been in a place like that. And then while I was in graduate school learning to design sets for the plays, uh, for theater, um, something happened in the church. Uh, the abuse scandal hit the church. And you may be too young to remember when this happened, but uh, back in the early 2000s, we realized that there were certain people in religious life and positions of authority in the church who were harming children in very serious ways. And this really shook the church. We were very shocked and saddened and scared by this. And right when that happened, I felt God start to go like, I said, <laughs> whoa, wait a minute, God, this is not my idea. I have no desire to do this. I want to be in the theater. I'm going to do all these other things. So hold on. It's not my thing. And God kept on going like this. And so eventually I said, okay, God, you're talking to me right now. I get that. However, I need to prove to myself that I can handle what I'm doing. I knew I wasn't supposed to be a priest. I thought I was being called to be a monk. I was supposed to be locked up in a monastery somewhere, praying every day, all the hours of the day, and that that was what I was called to be. I knew I wasn't supposed to be a priest. <clears throat> and so I said, God, you've got to wait. I've got to finish school. I've got to go out and I've got to get a job. And I've got to prove to myself that I am not a 
afraid of the world. I'm ready to tackle the world and do what I need to do in the world. And so I put it aside. And I started writing new poetry. Um, I started really paying attention to, to what poetry was in my life, learning new language for poetry, how to speak in a symbol and image. And after graduate school, I moved to Chicago. And in Chicago, I was working for a company that uh, built sets for plays. I was working as a carpenter. And I, I wasn't happy. Um, I, I was in the wrong place. <clears throat> and my poetry was really starting to reflect that. And as I was you know, living in the world, God began to speak to me through the images in the world. Um, I really believe that God speaks to us in languages that we can understand. God won't speak to you in a language you don't get, because that doesn't make sense, right? How would God call you to something if you can't understand what he's talking about? Um, and so God started speaking to me through the natural world around me. Um, I'd be walking down the street, and I'd be wearing my hoodie, and I'd see my shadow on the ground in front of me with the hood, and I would say, I'm supposed to be in a hood, I'm in the wrong place. Um, I'd be walking down the street, and I'd see two turtle doves up on a, uh, on a wire, right? And I'd say, oh, the two turtle doves, that was the price that Mary and Joseph paid so that Jesus could, you know, that was the price for the circumcision, so he could, um, they could keep him and not give him to God, right? And those two birds flew away. It's like, oh my gosh, my price for myself just flew away. So all these things kept on happening in my life. Um, more images telling me that in the world, talking to me, saying you are not in the right place, you're supposed to be doing something else. <clears throat> so finally I started paying attention again. And I started looking around and got some, a monastery at the Carmelites, and that really didn't work the way I was hoping it would. I, I couldn't do what I needed to do to be there. And so I finally talked to my parish priest, and I said, you know, I think God's calling me to something, but I don't know what. Um, maybe to be a deacon. I know I'm not supposed to be a priest. And so uh, Father Mark mentioned um, a couple of religious sources. He mentioned the Capuchins, but I'd never heard of the Capuchins before, right? Um, it's like, okay, that's great. Um, but then the next week in the parish bulletin, there was a bulletin insert saying, come meet the Capuchins in Milwaukee. I said, oh, I've heard of these people. Maybe I'll try it out. And so I called the vocation director, and I went to Milwaukee for this weekend, and I met an old friar whose name was Brother Mark, and he had been a blues musician in India. He had like played the guitar, and he had been in blues and jazz places before he had a religious life. <clears throat> that was kind of cool, because right, I had been in the arts. And then he said, you know, if you go to the Jesuits, they're going to teach. If you go to the Dominicans, they're going to preach. If you go to the Benedictines, they're going to pray. But if you come to the Capuchins, they say, what's your special gift, and how can we use that to build up the kingdom of God? I said, I'm a poet, I'm an artist, and a theater person. This is where I'm supposed to be. And so I started talking to the vocation director, I filled out the paperwork, and within six months I'd entered postulancy. I'm one of the fastest people I've ever entered the province uh, of my order, where I live and work. Um, and I'm still here, I'm the only person who made it through my theology class. Um, and I've never regretted the decision. Um, it's been really good. Um, and of course, once I entered religious life again, all that art that I had given up, when I thought I wasn't good enough to be an artist, all came back. God gave that all back to me. So uh, God has a sense of humor. Um, once I got what I want, once God got what God wanted, I got what I wanted too. Um, so now I'm, I'm doing this. Um, I feel very called to be a spiritual director. I want to be a spiritual director. Um, and right now, um, I'm working in Milwaukee with the poor and the homeless in Milwaukee. Before that, I had been at a boys' boarding high school at St. Lawrence Seminary as a campus minister and a spiritual director to the high school boys. And I got called to be here. It was something I had uh, not wanted to do, something I, I had been interested in doing, and yet I got sent here. Um, and I will tell you that working with high school boys and homeless men, they're about as far apart on the spectrum as it gets. Um, but it's been a really good experience for me. Um, I've learned a lot about myself in the past two years. Um, I've learned a lot about what poverty and homelessness means to me. I've learned to open myself up to the poor and to the disenfranchised, which is what being a Franciscan is all about, right? Um, I have a lot of good friends, a lot of people I talk to on the new program every day who I, I associate with, and they are they're important people in my life. Would would never have happened to me if I had not been um, if I had not been here in Milwaukee and been religious. Um, that's one of the interesting things about being a Franciscan. Franciscans are on the margins, and we associate with people who you might not normally associate with: the poor, uh, the disenfranchised, immigrants, um, all sorts of people um, who we don't always meet in our regular. And that's been very transformational for me. It's helped me really to see um, who God is and who Christ is in the world. So that's me. That's me, Brother David. Um, I hope that as you do your own discernment, 
um, that you just think maybe they, being a brother is what you want to do. Um, a lot of people don't get it. People say, why would you be a brother and not be a priest? And I can't explain it. I just know that as a brother, I get to be in that relationship with people that fulfills me, helps me be with people where they are. And I really love that relationship. So I want to say, um, have a good day. And maybe we'll see all of you at St. Ben's or the House of Peace, helping us out sometime, ministering to the poor and the homeless of Milwaukee. Peace and good.